Hi there, I'm Deep Dylan. Welcome to your AI Injection, the podcast where we discuss state-of-the-art techniques and in artificial intelligence with a focus on how these capabilities are used to transform organizations, making them more efficient, impactful, and successful. Let's so go. maybe before we get started, Adrian, you can give us a little bit about your background. Maybe for the audience's benefit, you can say how you know how you know me, and a little bit about your background as a product person, as somebody who's interested in AI, and then we can just kind of dig in from there. Yeah, sure. Um, so like my AI interest was like, I don't know, like forever, right? Like that's when I was selecting colleges to go to. I read, uh, you know, Gerda Lester Bach. Um, you know, and gotten really into like, hey, what could it mean for computational processing systems? And like, you know, I was a big fan of Dan Dennett and thinking about emergence of consciousness from symbolic systems. So, um, so naturally, it was basically it was basically like Carnegie Mellon and Stanford um, that had these great kind of cognitive science meets computer science programs. I was all up in the symbolic systems, designed my major in intelligent decision systems. Which, so this is like the early '90s, right? And so it was it was a lot of you know. Um, applied Bayes theorem and kind of, you know, um, belief nets, influence diagrams, yeah. um, but also like, you know, perceptrons and the early versions of, you know, feed forward neural nets and genetic programming, genetic algorithms and that kind of stuff. Um, and then came out of, came out of college into Microsoft where uh, probably for the first, I don't know, six or seven years, like a lot of the product stuff I worked on was kind of like being the geek that sits in between the research. Cause a lot of the guys that I worked in in Palo Alto got, headhunted by uh, Nathan Mirabal to build MSR. And, mm -hmm. and I kind of was not like, I had no PhD. I was into the stuff, but I was more like, I want to sit on the, the product side of the fence. And so I ended up kind of doing a lot of liaising and, you know, kind of like trying to translate and massage customer requirements and, you know, figure out how can we, how can we do this stuff. And um, so I did, and then that spiraled. So the, most of my stuff was in office in the early days. Like I did the answer wizard, which I think most people probably think of Clippy when they think of that. <laughs> yeah, it's because, the first thing that went in my head. I'm like, yeah, because, I'm clip. <laughs> right, right. Well, because we actually did the answer wizard in office 95 and then we slapped the social UI on top of an office 97 it was a short gap, but like all that stuff in the answer wizard, like was, you know, sort of su simple, natural language, bag of words, Bayesian inference model kind of stuff. And so that was one of the, um, most of my early, most of my early and mid career at Microsoft was about incorporating AI and machine learning into the product offerings and AI and machine learning. Like when you use these phrases today, like, you know, it's this moving target, right? Like st the stuff that I worked on, if we talk, you know, we talked about like, what did you work on in like 98 or 2004? I think most folks today would go like, oh, well, that's not. AI, that's just like a particular kind of directed search or, you know, like that's not AI, that's just, you know, a, a statistical, you know, propagation and like, and that, and it's just funny because where we are now with what we think of as AI and, and you know, classification systems and, uh, you know, ANNs and all that kind of stuff, like for the longest time, AI was basically just smart directed search, right? Like it was, it was basically just searching through a hyperspace. Anyway, so well, I mean, I think it's, for those that have been around for a while, I mean, you just couldn't even say AI without being kind of embarrassed and like looking at your shoes yeah, and being sure. like, I, I mean, sound like a putz, like I can't use these letters. But now when you, you know, when you talk about GPT-4, it feels unfair to not, to let or to only think about machine learning like as a term, because it's, I, I don't know about you, but I, I didn't think in my lifetime I'd be looking at a system like GPT-4 and interacting with it and having these this insane level of reasoning ability. I just didn't think I would yeah, see, live so to see it. I do not want to, I, like, look, I don't want to recapitulate your the whole thing with Carson, but I'll tell you, when I started playing with GPT-3 and GPT-4, my first assumption was that there were some really interesting controlling layers over, because, you know, the, the LLM is basically like just a Markov process on steroids, right? Like, I'm, and that sounds, I don't mean to be dismissive in saying that, but it's, it's a very specific kind of production system, right? And so when I started seeing how rich and nuanced the language outputs were- It's kind of um, mind blowing, yeah. I was like, oh, so there must be some kind of sort of ontological or cognitive layer on top of this stuff. And to an extent, the attention the attention models are, are some of that using the document history as kind of like a, 
you know, storage system. But when I started going back and reading the papers and going from, you know, 2008 and coming forward, I'm like, no, that is it. It is just. Well, it, yeah, I mean, it turns out if you train a system to predict future sequences of text, you also happen to train it to read and to right. understand language and to understand languages human or otherwise you know and and like all this other stuff just shakes out and it's just kind of a i don't know it's just not an intuition i i had before i started seeing these things i was i wouldn't have guessed it you know but it's but such I do. an interesting wrinkle right because like you know you and i are sort of in a, in a similar like you know epic right like so most of our careers we were for lack of a better like over promising and under delivering right like or, or, <laughs> i would or, like, totally agree with that like, or like working on you know, like I can't do that problem, but I can do this toy well-bounded version of that problem. Yeah, and I can so do like, this really itty bitty thing that will give you the ability to like promise a lot. Right, right. Right, but now now it's just nuts. Now I'm literally like, you know, Minsky's society of mind, like taking this idea of like many minds and I'm literally coding it in a day across 40 different minds and getting it to work. I can't believe this is happening. But but anyway, we could we can GPT-4 forever, but I want to I want to switch the conversation over to like product yeah. specifically because we got a lot of folks that build products that listen to this to your AI injection and you know, it's not every day that we get somebody on that's like really deep in just how to build products. So maybe jump up a few layers and like think back, you know, a bit. Walk us through how do you go from like, you know, maybe you have a product in some arena, you generate some data, you've got some data, you got some intuition about this data um, of something high value that you can extract or do with it. How does that go from that intuition and idea and data to a crisp idea of what a product um, should be that leverages, you know, some machine learning or some AI. So you can stop and redirect me if you want. But I'm, I'm going to start with a couple of here's what it's not kind of thing. Um, sure. And it might sound incredibly trivial or boring, but like in general, you're trying to identify an unmet need and meet that need, right? Like, so you're looking for you're looking for a pain point that um, a particular you know demographic or a particular market experiences and then you're trying to figure out hey can i solve that pain point and this sounds super basic and it is super basic but i want to say it again because i think whenever a new wave of technology comes along like whether it's um you know voice ux with you know echo speakers or uh or whether it's facial recognition or whatever it is i think there's this this inversion that happens for a while where, where the question for, you know, product managers or, or C-level folks of like, what should we build becomes, oh, how do I use X in my industry, right? Like, and now you've got the hammer looking for the nail. And though I, I can totally empathize with that sort of top-down mindset, that is not, in my experience, likely to produce a fruitful outcome. <laughs> like, if you, if you approach it as like, Oh, you chat GPT is all the rage. Well, my industry is, you know, used car sales. What is chat GPT going to do for used car sales? You might get some inspiration coming from that, but you got to keep backing off and rooting in, okay, well, let me look at my list. Cause I probably got a list of what are some pain points, right? Like, and then evaluate those as to how can this technology, how could this technology help me solve those? That I think that's a super important point because the hammer looking for the nail thing is what most technologists wind up doing for yeah. the chunk of their careers, right? And I think almost almost every academic does this, at least if in engineering departments or computer science departments. Are you almost saying like, if you want to sort of leverage new kind of capabilities that can drive some innovation, it's almost like you're saying, well, maintain a list or something of those capabilities but at the top, you're anchored in, you know, your core user that you're trying to make their lives better or in some way. And um, and now you're looking for intersections or something. Exactly. I don't know when the right point to sort of branch into this is. I do think that the scale and speed of synthesis of information that is becoming possible um, with these well-trained LLMs opens up a new avenue of product exploration, right? Um, so if you think of the traditional model or maybe traditional is the wrong word, but like, let's talk about, you know, being lean, right? Like product startup lean model. It's 
okay, I've got my pain point. I'm going to shop the idea through my network, validate, you know, that this is a customer pain point. Now I'm going to sort of assess, you know, uh, what's my potential addressable market, right? So I'm going to throw up a landing page. I'm going to throw up some surveys that hit to a landing page. I'm going to, you know, SEO this. I'm going to SEO that, see what, you know, see what clicks. If I have enough sticking on the wall, now I'm going to build the MVP, see what adoption looks like and scale from there, right? That's kind of the lean playbook. Yeah. And, and it's great. Like, it's a good playbook. I love it. What, I, what you can imagine being possible with the scalability and um, of something like, you know, GPT-4 or its successors is you can fail faster on some of these ideas or some of these investigations you're doing, right? And so I'm going to get a little bit sci-fi here, but I don't think too much. And you can say something like, hey, based on available, you know, very, you know, Picard talking to, you know, the ship, based on available demographic data, like what's the approximate addressable market for, you know, my idea of foo? And what's the median income of consumers who would be interested in a foo solution? Right. Like like data that might take you might have taken you weeks or a month to kind of like corral and synthesize, you can get to the price of a question now, assuming that you can trust your go ahead. So, so this is interesting. I want to make sure I understand you here, but you're basically saying use GPT uh, to help you think through your product and your pl product planning process. And all the way down to the questions that you would have ran off before, like four months ago and started looking for actual data, just talk to it and start to get to it quicker? The short answer is yes, but I'm going to sort of hedge that with saying like, look, if you're just, and this, this will get to the, I think we'll get to this all down the road about when we start talking about, you know, who benefits from this stuff, who owns the models, who, you know, who does Laura's to, you know, update checkpoints for the models and all that kind of stuff. But you've got to have the right data in there, right? Like you, it's not mad, like the systems are great, but they're, they're trained on what they're trained on. I think the, the scenario that I'm lining out here with you and you follow up with like, okay, I'm, you know, as long as I'm fleshing this out and I'm thinking of doing a combinator, you know, kind of, you know, an incubator thing on it, like what Fortune 1000 companies would be interested in acquiring a food solution and how would that fit in with their current product or, or you know, services portfolio? The kind of stuff that you basically, you, you can think of it as a combination of market research and analyst report stuff that you used, used to maybe, you know, slog through for weeks or a month. It's totally reasonable, given the right, you know, whether it's plugins or whatever your data model is, that you should be able to get that in minutes through using a large language model. What does that mean for what you do as a product manager if you're getting such meaningful strategic feedback so fast? Like, does that mean you're able to spend more time pick like fine tuning between what product you go and focus on or what feature area you go and focus on? Like two things I'll say. One is I throw that out there as kind of like, look, in my experience, most founders or most, you know, um, senior product folks, like we don't have a shortage of pain point ideas, right? Like we don't need any help generating like, oh, I'd like to start a business. What might I do? You know what I mean? What we have a shortage of is understanding which of the pain points we perceive, like how big those are for the rest of the world and how monetizable they are, right? And so that's what the whole MVP process is meant to fast track is, yeah, you've got this idea, like, you know, you're a parent, you've been watching how bad, you know, bark and circle are for doing, you know, parental control. And so you have this feeling that there's space in the marketplace for better parental controls for, you know, net nanny kind of stuff. Great, that's an intuition you have, but now you need data to prove or disprove that intuition, right? I will make the, the assertion that a system like and what, you know, whatever, whatever kind of oracular system you, you are trusting, it's never going to be able to tell you how to do the right thing or like how excellent to do it, but it will help you spot a bunch of negative paths quickly. And so you can fail fast on things that would, would be non-starters. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. Have data, have a hypothesis on some high value insights that if extracted automatically could transform your business. Not sure how to proceed. Bounce your ideas off one of our data scientists with a free consult. Reach out at zionics.com. You'll talk to an expert, not a salesperson. Everything that you've said so far is general to any kind of product feature, right? Yeah. So where does the... AI angle happen? I mean, like one part of it is just literally using the AI to help you think about product. 
right. the AI system for that. But there's another part that's like, I mean, you could, I, I suppose, just directly go to ChatGPT and ask it like, hey, what's the, I mean, I, do, I actually do this a fair amount. Like what's the AI innovation angle on historic product X? Those of us who've been like building these systems forever, we just have like all this intuition about particular places to look. Mm -hmm. So for example, like the second I saw chat GPT-4, I immediately thought, oh my gosh, there's going to be a new generation of customer, uh, of, of customer experience uh, things, you know, everything from totally. like, yeah. you're like, I think, you know, because, because you can just kind of immediately like clicks, but like other times, other, like other ways to use um, AI ML is a little more nuanced. Like, hey, what can I forecast here? Like, what can I predict here? That would be a value. Um, and is that just a small part of a solution or is there a way to like turn this into a, like, let's say you're working in a startup, uh, you know, or a, an, an early stage project to turn it into like a factory of AI where there's a lot of machine learning AI drip powered innovation that's going to go into this thing continuously. Like what's your process for kind of getting to there or do you not? And you're like, look, I don't, I don't care. I'm solving a product for a customer. Um, if I have a, uh, an efficiency that I need to improve, then I look, otherwise I don't like, like, how do you, how do you think about that? I'm having trouble wrapping my head around what does it mean to have a deeper or an AI factory pipeline? Because I think I am, maybe it's just my, my own biases or my own perspective. I am definitely like strapped in to the model of like, well, I know what my customer you know, segment is. Like, I know what I want my product to do. And I'm trying to figure out how to do it better. The main capabilities that I'm looking at from the language models, other than impersonating humans, which is also great, like is that rapid synthesis of data that whether you're just an end level consumer and you used to do like 13 Google searches and then you know, click on a link and read it for six minutes and then click on another link and read it for six minutes, like the streamlining that into, oh, could you build me a table of you know, like all the different um, mosquito repellents and summarize available data on, you know, like how effective they are against West Nile virus. I don't have a vision of like, oh yeah, this is the, you know, like sort of the Nissan production line of, you know, AI soup to nuts. I think I more have a, a, a thought process around like, well, I know what I want to do, or I have an idea of what I might want to do and how can I move faster in that direction? So it's an efficiency yeah, I think in a so. way. I think it is. Um, but well, and then being a geek, right? Like I have all these, um, even though I just said, like, don't be top down, like there are all these things that sort of spark for you. Like when you see image prompting in the latent diffusion models, and you know, alongside the text prompting, you, you just and and you're a your parent and you see your kids' drawings and you just sort of play with them and you take their drawing, but then you sort of like up level it into kind of a slightly Pixar Disney fied version of that. Oh, and then by the way, you auto bone it and auto rig it in Maya and then turn it around. Like and in 15 minutes, you've made them a video yeah. avatar where they can play with their drawing. None of that would have occurred to me if those tools hadn't been in front of me. But that's a very- so I, feel like you're, I feel like you're sort of touching on something that maybe you, is just so natural for you, you don't think about it. You're playing in essence. Yes. Like you're, you're grabbing these tools and you're playing. And when you play, you're just trusting you're going to have ideas from that. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. That particular example I gave was just something you're just like, hey, wouldn't this be neat? Like I my kids are really loving this thing. Like, I wonder if I could. And then you just sort of, like you said, like you sort of play, you mess around with it, and you're like, oh, they love it. This is cool. I mean, I feel like that's worth digging in a little bit more because I find I go into a few different modes, right? Like I if I see a new tech capability, the first thing is I have to think, do I care enough to even read about it? That has to kind of pass a bar. Like you know, and usually like, you know, we all have our techniques. I've got a bunch of feeds. I got a bunch of people in my feeds and they're some people, if they say I should look at something, I look at it right away. And other ones, I look for more. Once they start reading about it, I have some intellectual ideas of what can be done, but I don't feel like I get to that kind of spark and obsession like you're almost describing in your, your example here until I actually download, play, write code, put APIs around stuff, actually use it, try it, dink around. But for me to do that, I have to pass yet another bar of motivation and interest. Like it has to have gotten to a certain point. Like if I think back to just, you know, in the LLM case, 
first time I saw LLM to first time I grabbed LLM and actually had it like write some poetry for me and then had it some kind of interactive thing going back and forth. My takeaways were pretty different from the reading about it. Oh yeah, that sounds interesting. I can see how that would help out with classification. I can see why we got an extra four points on that task. Like it's different, right? And I feel like a lot of people just don't take the time to do the, the hands-on play, but it's like almost, it's okay for them. I don't to know those people do. deep. I don't, yeah. I don't know that you know many of them either, but like. <laughs> I see that, I see that happening though. I see where there's like different levels of play and obsession, right? There's people who wind up um, building things or being involved in the process that maybe have some engineers around them and like, yeah. you, you know, and I feel like it's just somehow different, but I, I want you to like, yeah, tell me why you don't think you have those friends around you and like what happens to the ones who play and what happens to those who don't. I think, I mean, you sort of talking about like, you know, so sort of social network selection bias and stuff now, I think. Um, like that's just kind of like how my mind works and how my brain runs right and and either that is like a shared kind of experience and like you know we we start, we start riffing off each other and we're both enjoying that conversation and that riff and then you know then we you know sort of clink glasses and go home um or if you're not thinking that way you're sitting there going this guy fucking talks a lot and <laughs> you know what I mean like like it's and it's all like super um it's like the guy that's always talking about snowboarding or something yeah, 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 and you're right? like, like it's, oh it's cool like, like where do you ride at usually oh you know like four years ago I went to such and such and you're like um why are you talking about it yeah. so much like it makes no sense <laughs> but it's even independent of domain but you're right but it's that same thing like for it's either engage you're either engaged by that kind of flow and and riffing or it's um, off-putting or possibly intimidating to you. And if it's the latter, then you're going to self-select not to spend more time with me. And I'm going to feel like, you know, I was looking at you and your face was dead the whole time I was talking about stuff that I was super passionate about. So I'm probably going to self-select and spend less time with you. And that's just the way it goes, I guess. I feel like a lot of these generative um, capabilities that are coming out are creating a world where people who maybe we're too intimidated to like fire up Python and learn some basic yes. code and like dig in there and try to get some stuff to work and read a little bit and hang out on Stack Overflow and put some APIs together. Yep. Like I've, I've personally run across multiples of folks that might've been like that a few months ago that are curious enough to just say like, hey, just build the code for me for this thing. Like, I feel like the bar is lowering and people are building capabilities. I don't know if you saw this, but like, I think it was like last week, can't remember the tool, but somebody's built this environment you know, on top of ChatGPT4, where you can just basically design a video game. So think like um, Galaga, but you're designing it from scratch via just interacting, you know, back and, and, and forth. And it's right into like, like Godot or Unity or something on the back yeah, end. And, yeah, yeah it's, it's putting together the whole. And so now all of a sudden, I feel like that's part of what's going on here with all this stuff is we've lowered the bar for creation. And creation is so important for getting that product obsession that gets this stuff out there. So like if we rewind like five years ago, 10 years ago, we could have got an API that did something. Like let's say we had great speech, speech transcription API comes yeah. out. People like you and I were going to have no problem finding our way to it and integrating it into products. But now I feel like it's like a different level, like that that obsession that we get because we grabbed it and played with it is that bar is going lower. And, and folks who never would have written code are going to, increasingly see an entire generation of new capabilities and creations. So, you know, going back to your Star Trek thing, it's like, you know, like you didn't have to know squat on Star Trek. You just wiggle your hands around and talk to the computer and like it keeps doing stuff. Right. That's the world we're entering. And I'm pretty in, much in violent agreement with you. Um, and, and first, of all, I think that's 80% a good thing. The only, the 20% the where I feel like, and we kind of got to watch it is I mean, having more people, lowering the bar and having more people generating content is an unalloyed good thing. But I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of this a bunch of specific examples in the back of my head. And most of them are actually around like the sort of male spectrum, like voice um, cloning stuff. There are a limited number of service providers that are wrapping this stuff up in a certain way with certain goals and means and ends of their own in mind. There are certain companies in that tend to assume we know we don't want people to hurt themselves on the sharp edges of technology 
right? Uh-huh. And so, and so we are going to make the product decisions behind the scenes to wall these things off or hide these things and play up and expose the flexibility of these other things, right? And the the bonus is that that makes it more accessible to a wider range of people, which is awesome. And the price is that it's they're inherently passing along their own bias for the direction and the use of the technology. But so that's my, I guess, my sort of slightly cynical caveat to the the mostly optimistic message, which is that yes, the more power is being put in the hands of people who didn't have to, you know, learn what like pointers or you know type safe programming was. It makes me think. Do you remember like I think it's maybe twenty years ago, all of these fancy visual IDEs were like all the rage. This is like net beans, and I'm just all this, and people yeah, started yeah. like. People started talking about like, oh, you know, everyone's gonna be able to write code. And you're just gonna have these visual things. You're gonna drag and drop. And no, like, you're right. Like HP was hugely into that. Oh like, yeah, like t- it was a big, it was a big area. Sun put like you yep. know tons of money into this. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft put in tons of money into this. And you know, I think almost universally at some point people realize like, well, yes, but it doesn't really take away the complexity. Like it just makes it harder almost. <laughs> like it's almost. Although- like, I think I think in so I'm you know game designer and game developer and so I think there are certain that's a great genre where it allowed so for example if you look at what Unreal lets you do both with like shader graph and materials graph and with you know the sort of visual programming language for the actions in Unreal I think that stuff's awesome because it takes what used to have to go over the wall from a level designer to a, a software engineer and get baked into a release and pushed back and become something that the level designer, because the, the interactions you're detailing there are more like timing things, like this button needs to be pressed and this button also needs to be pressed for this door to be open and then that triggers this other event. And so I think there was some payoff in, in certain, you know, sub, I don't know what we call them, like subgenres or, you know, subsets yeah. of the market that was really great. And, and the shader graph is another great example. Like who wants to learn, you know, a bunch of matrix transformations in order to like, you know, develop a, an outline shader you know, for your, um, for your models, but when you can literally kind of stack them on top of each other, almost like filters in Photoshop and see what's happening, like that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate you pushing up back on that because you're absolutely right. Like it's almost like you get this promising new big thing. Tons of people get obsessed with it. The vision gets over promised. Then the pockets where it didn't deliver get slightly disillusioned. Right. But then there's pockets where it truly did deliver. But the, the reason I brought it up was not um, was not that so much as we've long had this vision of not having to learn low level coding capabilities, but to be able to create, right? Like this yeah. vision has been there for decades and decades. And we've had um, limited successes here and there. And, and today, you know, it's all about the text to coding kind of, I mean, a lot of that vision is also there. Right. And I think um, there are going to be pockets, just like you're saying that where it's really going to pan out. Uh, And there's going to be others probably where it it really doesn't, you know, like it's going to get oversold. The question I have is like, what's the, what's the real value for product as people who build product in taking that bar and lowering it and getting it so that more prevalent skilled folks can like create. There's a bunch of stuff that's sort of swimming in my head and and I'm not sure, I don't want to like get sidetracked. Like one thing that I'm kind of putting a pin on and setting aside is every time this happens for a community, there's a bunch of people who are like great, more stuff and eventually the cream will rise to the top. And so, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. And there's also a, a kind of backlash to most stuff is crap, right? Like it was better when only the people that really had passion and care. And you see this, Again, I'm going back to games like with with Unity, Unity did a really great job of creating the asset marketplace, right? Where it wasn't just models and meshes. It was like, oh, you were trying to do pathfinding. Well, here's a little, you know, essentially it, it was the asset store was like Stack Exchange for people that don't know Stack Exchange, right? And suddenly you started seeing what they call asset flips pop up all over the Steam store, which is like, I just made a match three. I don't know anything about programming, but I bought... I bought this logic piece and I bought these assets and I bought these tiles and I published this thing in Steam and hoped that someone would pay 99 cents for it. And now suddenly the market's flooded with this crap. And um, where am I, where does that link back to your question of as a product manager, how does this, how does lowering the bar uh, help? I guess the most direct way is, is if it lets you be the person 
that does that playing rather than having to delegate that play to somebody else and hope that they come back to you on it. I'm 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 taking what you're saying and I'm I'm translating it for for a minute, which is like you're lowering the cost at which you can get to an MVP in an early stage startup or something. And and you're and you're I also yes you are and by doing that you also again I don't know how much everyone has my own psychological mindset but I'm aware of my own fear of failure as being sometimes a gate right like it prevents you from trying something new because. Like, well, you know, what if I spend six days working on this and it ends up really just kind of blah, right? Like, and what's my, so what's my initial prior on that? And like, you know, so that, like you said, it sort of informs my passion level. <laughs> how much, yeah, how much yeah, money. yeah. And, but if you lower that cost from like, you know, six days to five hours, it lets, it gives me more at bats, right? There you go. I think Be that's what it is. Yes. Because we're, we're, we're always like, as people who build product, we are in a number, I mean, as much as great as certain product people can be and can always hit it out of the park, you, you're you usually playing a probability game. Like you will yeah. fail. Yeah. Like you're going to fail a certain number of times. And you're just, because there's just, it's just like a complicated process of, for building great product. You're right. Like, otherwise you're, you're constantly doing this resource analysis, you know, trade off of like, you know, how much wood do I put behind this arrow? How much, because I have other arrows I could fire, right? Um, and this lets you do more. You're listening to your AI injection brought to you by Zionix.com. That's X Y O N I X.com. Check out our website for more content or if you need help injecting AI into your organization. This is, this is kind of an area in general that we see in tech, which, um, Every once in a while, I have a conversation with somebody that's like not involved in the tech industry, and they're like, "I don't understand." So, so this question, I'll, I'll I'll throw it in the context of Twitter, but I think you could put it in the context of just about anything. I don't understand how somebody could lay off like whatever percentage, 80, 85 percent of the people yeah. in a company, and then have the company keep worrying uh, working. And I don't want to overindex on Twitter, but the the answer I usually give is something like this: It's like, well, what a lot of people don't understand is that the high tech industry is largely speaking an ecosystem of bets being placed. <laughs> and tons of us are in this machine placing bets and placing bets and placing bets or being in the bet. <laughs> and not all of these things are going to win. And in fact, the things that win can come from like an inordinately few number of people. So like, I think Instagram was like eight, what, eight folks, you know, that pre-created at that time, $3 billion in value in a, in like, I think it was like 16 months or something. And, and later on, you can fast forward 12 years later and there's like a, a tons of people working there. But generally speaking, that's largely what's going on, right? Agreed. I, I think, I mean, there, I, I don't want to like bring out all the old chestnuts, but there's also the, you know, the pivot, right? Like the thing you thought you were building actually turns out, oh, it's really this other thing, right? Like whether, like I think Slack is probably the most overused example for that, but it's a good one. Of, yeah, we were just doing this as a means to an end, but it turns out this is the product, right? I'm kind of noodling on it and I, I, I won't suck up too much time, but I want to go back to what we were saying about more at bats. And I'm, I'm thinking about a couple of things in my, that are in my own personal experience. Like one was at every, when we were, we had curators who were helping, you know, helping the automated channel creation and sort of like, you know, tuning it and teaching it. And I created this like really crappy, like, um, um, macro media flash tool, right. To be able to go in and like edit some of the channel definitions and play with the hero images and stuff. And just by doing that and, and reducing the, the task and like basically allowing the editors to directly access that stuff instead of having to, you know, file tickets and push it through into a release, the quality of the channels that came out was so much, started being so much better because they could do it themselves and not have this high overhead cost. And then the other example that occurs to me is when um, in orgs that I've been in where people have done a lot of work of taking what's, you know, some huge massive collection of chained, you know, SQL tables and putting a nice front end on it so that like marketing and um, product development people can easily pivot and, and filter through that data. Like every time that's a repeating pattern of when that, when some internal tools person does that, there's always like this insight that comes out of like, oh, like, cause the, it was in there in the instrumentation data or it was in there in the, you know, in the signup path data. 
but like, oh my God, all our major convert, like we have like 80% conversion from people coming from this thing. Maybe this is where our market is, right? So I'm maybe perhaps needlessly elaborating on that point, but it it's really just the value that comes from reducing the, the number of layers of indirection between the, the data or the code and the person who can be inspired by it. That's interesting. And that goes back to our theme here, which seems to be emerging of pushing down the, I, I guess maybe the better way to say it would be like making creation ex more accessible or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that does feel inherently valuable. Like we can we can probably rattle off. When you were telling that story, I was thinking of the rise of Tableau, you know, yeah, where, you right. know like where, you know, you had Excel for, for and, and, and that generation of spreadsheets kind of on one path. And then you had kind of the emergence of Tableau where it was mirroring the easy kind of construction of the analysis but with the distribution side and make and piping it in with like real time uh, data feeds and and marrying those two together but also pushing down the creation abilities that it took to do that right and 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 now you have this kind of huge emergent capability i i love that theme um making creation more accessible that that seems valuable so i have a question for you like so talking to all the people that build product like what do you think is you know when you think about all this generative abilities that are emerging like what do you think is the, like maybe the most important question that people aren't asking right now that they should be i don't know i don't know if there's any question that people aren't asking by the way so like i said my every almost twice a week since february i've had someone from my network reaching out and like grabbing coffee or you know getting a drink to sort of run some idea past me um or ask a question. So I, I feel like, wow, a lot of like all the right questions are being asked in a lot of ways. Can I, can I, let me toss out two kind of related questions. You tell me if there's interest in drilling down either. One of, one of them is, would be um, to turn that around a little bit. What are some of the either wrong questions or wrong solutions that people are over-focusing on in, ah, in my okay. humble opinion or not so humble opinion. And then number two would be what are, what are like, if you if you zoom out as far as you can, what are sort of, sort of the biggest picture things that you wonder or worry about, right? With this way of stuff. I'll try to take your first one. I mean, okay. one of the one of the, uh, one of the things that I think people are like over indexing on in a way they're over indexing on this idea of let's just take of the provider like the generative engine providers. Let's take ChatGPT, like OpenAI. They're over indexing on the interface that OpenAI is, is giving you and like actually going in there and using it. Um, we have yet to, like, we're just now barely starting to get products that are built on the API behind the scenes that, that take away all of that, you know? So I feel like from the very first moment I saw that, I was like, this is not how we're going to be using this forever, but for now I can. Right. But, it's really like everyone under the sun's thinking, how do I get product out of this that makes it so that you don't even know what's going on? And it's so, I mean, I'm just going to rip on that a little bit because I think it's super interesting. For example, there, there's going to very quickly, I guess it's probably, it's probably safe to say it's already emerged. Um, I bet there are a number of companies, and I don't say this based on any data of looking at LinkedIn. I just think that, so feel free to fact check me and prove me false. But I would, I would not be surprised if already people were writing job descriptions for and hiring prompt engineers. Oh, right? no, this is a thing. This is yeah. totally a thing. So, like big bucks too, which blows my mind. Yes, but it, my two pennies for what it's worth on that is like, what both what an interesting job, but also what an amazingly short-lived window of opportunity there is for that <laughs> particular profession. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like for some double digit number of months, or if you're lucky, some medium single digit number of years, that will be a need. But yeah. literally every day you go to work, you are literally training your own automated replacement, right? <laughs> like, and, and so maybe that's a, you know, if you're okay with that and you get it and you're like, yeah, but in the meantime, you know, they offered me, you know, $135,000 in remote work. Like I'll take yeah. it. That, that's totally cool. Like as long as everyone's clear on what's going on, but you know, if you, I think if, you'll accidentally learn some other things too, though. I mean, like you have to. <laughs> I hope so. You hope so. But like, I guess I look at that and I, whatever, maybe I'm 
sounding like a super cynical word, but I look at that and I think, yes, for num number one, that's a great, like interesting opportunity for a very short period of time, right? Like, yeah, but that that's always the case, isn't it? Like when the new thing comes, like when computer science came along, I guarantee you there were a lot of mathematicians that are sitting around and like, whatever, like, it's just a branch of math. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, it's just going to, I think yeah. it will just grow out, right? Like, because uh, prompt yeah. engineer will just be the, I mean, it might change its name, but it, because like, once you got your prompt, then, then you're immediately confronted with the bottleneck of uh, the constraints around few shot. You're like, okay, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven, maybe yeah. eight examples. And then next thing you know, you're fine tuning. And then, and once you're fine tuning, you're like, okay, I'm sick of paying. So I'm going to pull this stuff down onto my own hosted models. And like, okay. there's that whole trajectory, right? So let's, I, I don't, maybe you did a, for all I know, you did a whole separate podcast in this, but I definitely want to put a pin on if you haven't and come back to touching on the, the case of where to, to, for people who don't pay to train from soup to nuts, their own, like, you know, $150 million model. How do you add, um, competitive advantage or value i totally want to talk I, and li literally like i've got it right here uh, ai moat question mark this is like the biggest question i've been getting asked from our clients okay. and i can think of no better person to ask it to than you so i'm going to ask this to you because okay. every every everyone's vcs say the same stuff constantly like hey you know what's your competitive advantage over yeah. time when you know when you're interacting with this like huge model you can't compete you can't build your GPT-5 like yourself. That's yeah. not what you're about. Um, and those models are getting so good. And it's not about text even. Like, you know, we can talk about text. We can talk about generative imagery. But all of them have the same phenomenon going on, which is the, which is the big centralized model is so powerful that your localized version is not giving you the competitive moat that it used to, right? Like if you rewind even just six months, that my answer was always basically the same. You're a startup, control your data that you generate, gather your data, don't be like kind of exclusively an aggregator, grab this stuff, that's gonna be your ultimate competitive moat, get training data, Turk, hire annotators, whatever you gotta do, um, label your data and then build your models. The actual algorithms themselves aren't gonna be the competitive data, it's that whole thing. But now it's like harder and harder to say that. I can probably still say that for time series data. I can't really say it for text. I can't say like if you had, you know, even if you were doing- But there's period. not a better answer, Dee. Like you you just summarized kind of, I mean, the best answer I can give. Like, cause, cause, so here's what I imagine the landscape will happen, right? There's gonna be some small single digit number of, like, let's say it's Microsoft, Alphabet, Meta, who knows, like maybe Oracle and like mm -hmm. Amazon, like, you know, kind of come from behind and, and you know, generate their own things. But there's going to be some very limited number of real providers for the kind of pre-trained models, right? And then there's going to be the question of, yeah, yeah, you, there, so there's no competitive advantage in licensing, right? Like, it's, it's almost like you license to not fall behind, not you don't license to get ahead, right? So the yeah. whole curve just shifts, and now you have to license just so you're not behind. And that, you know, swimming to keep up never feels good, right? But you, you kind of got to do it. And, but then when you ask the next question of, you know, how do you, how do you get ahead and not just fall behind? Um, I think the answer really does come back down to like, well, you've got to get, you've got to have some unique data to offer for whether you're doing a, a you know, a LoRa or whether you're doing, you know, a checkpoint or like, let's assume that you're not, you, you don't have the money or the resources to, to build the whole thing, but hopefully more of the, you know, like these, you know, um, low rank adaptation, you know, post-training models will become effective and you can be really good at leveraging the data that you do have access to, to be better in this niche than someone who just takes this thing off the shelf and deploys it. But um, you don't think that that story has gotten lame lately? <laughs> like, I feel like that's the story I've been using for 15 years, but it feels, it feels like a not, like not a slam dunk anymore. It feels but, like- but, does, but is the reason it feels like not a slam dunk, not because, is it perhaps, be, not because it's not true, but because- many people don't have any critical mass of differentiating data or, or isn't that a great question sorry like or maybe another yeah. way to ask you, <laughs> i mean if you yes, drill down I into think, why I does mean, it feel lame yeah i mean okay maybe 
Need help with computer vision, natural language processing, automated content creation, conversational understanding, time series forecasting, customer behavior analytics? Reach out to us at zionix.com. That's X Y O N I X.com. Maybe we can help. Maybe that is, that covers certainly that covers a few cases that were at the top of my mind, but like, but maybe let me ask it this way: like, does there even exist? Like, let's take text because I think it, the text is so much further ahead as far as these big models. In the case of text, does there even exist a corpus of data that you can like really, really train on where you can't, where you can like outperform GPT four enough that it actually matters? Like, doesn't GPT-4 have to actually be bad at something so for, you to not excel, to, for you to excel enough for it to matter? And I would okay. argue it's not that bad at, like, I can't find that many holes. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, like, obviously with, like, math and, like, certain, like, but as far as, like, reading well and reasoning off the reading, mm. I mean, it's it's generally quite reasonable. I disagree. Um, okay, let's hear it. Let's hear uh, it. So... First of all, like I'm just going to do the, the the caveat, like and yes, let let's set aside all those things, you know, that actually require like an explicit computation model or the building of an explicit yeah. computation model. Um, although, sorry, I can't help but even mention, I won't drill on it, I promise. But like when you think of the massive number of um, neural nets that you're training in all those different channels with all those different intention models, and they're all semantically opaque. You honest, it's not likely, but it is possible that some more structured representations are emerging there. But set, well, set a pin on that and set it aside. Um, as a user for this, for my own like hobbies and passion projects, right? I can tell you that if you're writing like some shit blog post on, you know, what are the top, what are the top weapons to use in Counter Strike? Chat GPT has nailed the bar for what you need to publish. Okay. If what you're trying to do is something that requires a little more than just that, I don't want to say pablum, but that just kind of like blah level of, yeah, I strung some words together and it kind of is coherent and makes sense. For example, uh, I am a DD GM, right? And mm -hmm. and the number of hours you spend prepping for you know the kind of shit that your players are going to encounter in you know in a given week for a session is a lot, and I would love if I could go to you know Chat GPT and say, hey, here's the like, give me a really nice evocative description for like an underground cavern with a big uh, that has a big uh, phosphorescent lake and a monster at the end. Like, give me three paragraphs on that, right? So that I don't have to spend you know probably forty minutes like building it myself. And that is something that, I don't know, first of all, I don't know if there's a market there, but that's an example of what ChatGPT does not do well. All the shit sounds the same. It all ends with something. And, and it was a place where evil always dwelt. And you're like, I don't know what thing you're- But isn't that just a matter of like a few months? Like as soon as we can fine tune on top of GPT-4, you know, you're going to give it a few thousand examples that are rich and colorful like you yes. want. And then at that point, does your startup not need- to like, like whatever you come up with, with a few thousand examples on top of GPT-4, it's not that much differentiation at the end of the day. It's not like the way it was a year ago where you've got, you know, your whole corpus and everything custom trained and all that, right? Like you're basically still a GPT-4 dependent, you know? I, okay, I, I don't disagree with you. And, I, and maybe, maybe the thing that we're just sort of arguing about now is, you know, how much like, is, is the problem is the reason it feels like a lame answer because the amount of data that you're talking about feels like no kind yes. of barrier. Because I anyone, think, yes, yeah. I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah. You don't need, like when you needed millions of examples for your deep learning model to do what X, Y, Z, it felt like a great answer to your investors. Like, okay, that's, that's a moat. But when you're talking about 2000 examples, maybe three, maybe 10, like- right. It, it, you know, to, and then maybe, okay, sure. Maybe you go to a hundred thousand, you get a half a percent more in efficacy. That doesn't feel like as strong of an argument. Let's, I feel like we're in empirical waters here and I don't know what the empirical answer is, but so let me posit two different possible worlds of the next, you know, N months. Let's say my goal, for example, in, in this kind of realm that we're talking about is, boy, like the way Stephen King writes or the way Guy Gabriel K writes or the way, you know, pick your favorite author here writes, 
I want my stuff to be in the style of X to the, with the same level of fidelity that I could go to mid journey and say in the style of NC Wyeth, right? And get mm -hmm. those kind of brushstroke things. One of two things is true. Either I'm going to be able to basically provide four books, like, like you know, four books worth of data points and then boom, the, it's going to, my, my lower, you know, my checkpoint is going to be able to produce that output or it's actually not because the because the priors are so heavy in the huge corpus that it trained on that shifting that momentum to have that kind of clausal structure it's never going to do and but so from David I mean it will it will spit that phrase out but it would never have come up with it you know what I mean like from that David Foster Wallace example and so either one yeah. either one thing is true either a I'm it will actually be like and we'll all be like holy fuck the bar just lowered again amazing or B you're going to have to step back and say, okay, I'm actually going to now, in order to get the output I want, I'm going to need to train on not just the raw data. I'm going to need to mark my data up in such a structured way. Like I'm going to need to go back and do some NLP and say, what makes this style, this style is this number of noun phrases, you know, you know in, this is how often we ship character points of view. And you're have, going to have to build some for lack of a better word, build some IP around the structure and the form of the data. And it, it feels like you're basically making, if I jump up a level from what you're saying, yeah. you're making the argument that people's tastes will get much more refined and they're going to want, they're going to read closer and want more. I don't know that people's tastes are going to get much more refined. I think they are, like, I think this is what you pay advertising agencies a huge buttload of money for right now is to like get my product like make it sound hip and not like some idiot who tried to make it sound hip i don't know yes but no I mean, actually that exam that that example is really good because you know just do it is yeah. in our brains it's so simple pretty sure chat gpt however good would not have come up with that if we rewind back in time like yeah okay this has been a Super awesome conversation. Uh, I feel like we covered a lot of terrain. Um, we're almost out of time. I'm gonna leave us with one final question. Fast forward five years, everything evolves the way that you're thinking it does. Like, what does the world of a product manager look like? Uh, it, specifically in terms of how it's different from today. You know, I mean, we, we've both been in sort of content processing and you know, massaging and republishing kind of uh, areas for a long time. And I think we're both very familiar with this idea of, you know, curation as being a, a role, right? Um, my, my short answer would be a very, a very true and very common saying is like, uh, you know, in the startup world is like, I don't give a shit about your idea. Ideas are a dime a dozen. And it's 99% execution, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that's going to completely change overnight, but if the execution is the thing that's being automated and, and uh, radically simplified, then the judgment in the idea actually is going to start to take up some of that space in terms of importance. So I'm totally like way out over my skis here, right? But I'm, I'm, if I'm, if I'm trying, especially because the pace of innovation is so insane right now, but I would imagine that if, if being a product and product manager at like, not, you know, not VP of product, but at a, a sort of like senior, like mid managing level right now is way more about cat hurting and blocking and tackling and way less about like, you know, thoughtful value judgments on, you know, different experiences. Um, I would like the I would like to believe that the composition of that job gets to change because a lot of the annoying blocking and tackling stuff gets reduced and simplified. Um, there's this whole world of answers that I think we definitely don't want to like dive into as we kind of wrap up, but there's this whole world of answers around legislation and IP and and how you're going to have to focus less on the tools and more on the source data that is I think a very deep root, but not something to not something to head into in like 60 seconds. I'll tell you the stuff that's rattling around in my head right now is very much around IP rights and legislation, like what people are going to do to kind of preserve the kinds of freedoms they think they want. Like if the question that I think people over index on way too much, that's not the right question is 
how do I exclude my output from the training set of whatever the tool is? That's the wrong question because someone can do something not exactly like you, but reasonably similar to you. And that will go into the training set and your, your output can still be commoditized, even if your literal source data didn't get ingested. Awesome. Well, thanks a ton for coming on, Adrian. That's all for this episode. I'm Deep Dylan, your host, saying check back soon for your next AI injection. In the meantime, if you need help injecting AI into your business, reach out to us at zionix.com. That's X-Y-O-N-I-X.com. Whether it's text, audio, video, or other business data, we help all kinds of organizations like yours automatically find and operationalize transformative insights.